Hello and welcome. Today is day one of 2018, so Happy New Year. Um, it's a perfect day to discuss the last book that I read in 2017, which is The Liberation of Life, which I finished yesterday. Um, and this is by Charles Birch and John B. Cobb Jr. Um, I read this book as part of my December rereading that I was doing. And um, so, yeah, I was really super interested to, to read this again. I last read this in college, I think around 1982 or 1983. This was originally published in late 1981. And I read it as part of a class in my, in my college. Um, Charles Birch and John B. Cobb... Um, Let's see, that Charles Birch, at the time of the writing of this book, was the Chalice Professor of Biology at the University of Sydney, and John B. Cobb Jr. was the Ingraham Professor of Theology and Director of the Center for Process Studies, School of Theology, Claremont, California. So I think that's kind of interesting that the co-authors, one was a, a biologist and one was a theologian. Um, so that it made a really uh, interesting and compelling argument uh, for their argument. So um, what this is about um, is uh, basically they're they're trying to uh, propose a new model for you know understanding the world or understanding the universe. Actually, um, they they call it an ecological model, and this is opposed to as opposed to like the mechanistic um, reductionist model that. Um, we in Western civilization anyway have been mostly using as our way of knowing, as our primary way of knowing uh, for the last few hundred years. Um, the book is structured, there's there's 10 different chapters, um, so I thought I'd just kind of run through them and it will give you an idea of kind of what's covered in the book. Um, so the first chapter is called Molecular, Organismic, and Population Ecology. Um, and then there's some sub chat, some little subheadings that are topics that are covered in that uh, under that heading, followed by a conclusion. Each of the chapters are structured this way, um, so it's really kind of nice because you read through it, and then at the end you do get a summary of conclusions that they're making from the information that they've presented. So chapter two is evolution, um, and some subheadings there are like chance and mutation, natural selection, human evolution. Uh, purposeful evolution. Um, so yeah, evolution is just kind of discussed. Uh, number three, models of living. These are, would be like the ecological model, the mechanistic model. Um, so some sub chats, some subheadings there are the functions of models, the mechanistic model, the vitalistic model, the emergent evolution model, and then toward a more ecological model, which is, you know, their purpose. And then number, chapter four is to the human and the natural. Um, and so here they, the, some of the sub, subheadings here are the ecological model of human existence. Um, do animals experience? So talking about some, um, you know, some non-human, um, some non-human, non-human living things uh, experience there as well. But they do talk a bit more about uh, life in general and defining life and the difficulty in defining life. And so this is one of the things I remember that that struck me as so profound back when I really originally read this back in the early '80s when I was in college was I had never come across this idea at that time yet of of there being this continuum between the inorganic and the organic and sort of the whole. Um, the whole, um, I guess, um, holistic sort of view of matter and life and, and such. So this is explained. Number five, chapter five, um, an ethic of life is called an ethic of life. And then some of the sub subheadings there are like why an ethic, ethics beyond, ethics beyond anthropocent, anthropocentrism, um, animal rights, human rights, and then biosphere ethics. So that chapter was really interesting. And then chapter six uh, was really one of my favorite chapters, and that's called Faith in Life. And in this chapter, uh, some of the subheadings are created goods and creative good, a man of faith, trusting life with a capital L, uh, life at, with a capital L as cosmic power, life as, e as evil, I mean, life and evil, and then life as God. And the interesting, uh, one of the interesting things I think about this chapter is it really, really reminded me of the book Star Maker, which I read recently and did a book chat on, uh, which I will link to in the details below, because in the this work of fiction slash science fiction um, by Olaf Stapledon, published in 1937, um, the Star Maker is sort of this... Um, consciousness, conscious entity that um, 
sort of creates universes. And so um, here, uh, life, they define life. In this chapter six, faith and life, they call capital L life is basically the same, I think, idea that is in this book, The Star Maker. So I always think that's kind of cool whenever I can take a nonfiction work like this that's somewhat academic and then relate it to a work of fiction or science fiction or some other genre like that. Um, I just think that's so cool when that happens. So I thought that was real interesting um, comparison too, of like how life, um, how life defined with a capital L life is actually about creation. And so anything that creates any process that creates is un, falls under the capital L life. So in this case, like a nebula would be life because it's a creation because the uh, one of the laws of the universe is entropy that everything winds down. But then we do have this uh, building of complexity out of simplicity, like a nebula. Um, and so there are forces but that were at work that, that create, but then ultimately nebulas all change and eventually change into something else and then cease to exist, just like every other kind of thing. So um, that's kind of cool, that kind of, that kind of explanation of capital L life. Um, yeah, but onward. Um, chapter 7 is called The Biological Manipulation of Human Life. Um, and here um, they talk uh, they talk a bit about genetic engineering and things like this, um, the, ma the manipulation of the human experience, manipulation of humans. This is all something that's you know really relevant even still today, even more so because since this book originally came out in 1981, of course we have uh, sequenced the human genome, uh, so there's a lot more known genetically, and so that technology and that knowledge has really advanced since this book was originally written. So that chapter is still you know pretty relevant. Chapter 8 is called A Just and Sustainable World. These last three chapters are all about sort of the future, um, sort of how to create a just and sustain sustainable world. And the subheadings here are justice, sustainability, the unsustainable and unjust world. Uh, here they make the argument that there can be no justice without sustainability and there could be no sustainability. And sust ultimately, sustainability means justice. So in their view. Um, chapter 9 is called Economic Development and Ecological Perspective. So using their model of ec their, their ecological model of way of knowing, um, they talk about economic development in light of that and how how economics and how the world's economic systems could be structured differently um, under their ecological model. And then chapter 10, the last chapter, is called Rule in Urban Development and Ecological Perspective. And here they talk about a just and sustainable agriculture, just and sustainable energy, and just and sustainable transportation and urban habitats. So um, again, how their model, um, if applied to certain other areas of human life, like cities and transportation and such, um, how it could be different and how it would be different. So yeah, that's sort of the overview of kind of what the book in general is about. Just some thoughts about it. Um, there is a real cool graphic that I'm, I wanted to show you uh, that I thought was real interesting and ap applicable to other other analogies, and here it is. This is actually showing, you probably can't tell much about it from here, but this is showing the development of an embryo. And so when an embryo starts out, it has lots of potentials, and it's got this kind of hump. So the further it goes along into development, the harder it is to cross over and become something else. So it's going to develop this way, and once it crosses this line, you know, it's harder for it to go and change directions. And I thought that was really sort of interesting because it's sort of, it's to me, it's sort of also an analogy of life. You know, as you are young, like for example, I might want decide right now I want to become an opera singer at my age, and it would be you know, the door has, the developmental door for that has already closed for me because I don't have any natural talent of singing at all anyway, much less opera singing. Um, but I, uh, the, my, the, the structure of my vocal cords and the training that's required to sing and operatically, um, I've moved beyond that point of being able to develop that, um, you know, at this point. So to me, that's kind of, it was kind of an interesting analogy that was applied not only to embryonic development, but then could actually be extrapolated out into just general life and how, you know, as you, as you move along life, you make certain choices. Um, and sometimes they're not even biological. Like I just gave you an example of biology, but even just choices, like you make a certain choice to enter a certain profession, it then becomes harder and harder as time goes on to completely switch gears into, into a different one, to a different um, 
profession or some other you know aspect of life. So I thought that was real cool. Um, and then I wanted to touch base a bit on substance thinking versus event thinking because this is talked about at length in this book, and this sort of it is, is an example of an ecological model. And so substance thinking and event thinking. Let's just take me. Um, so me, you know, I am a material thing. I exist as a material object. Um, I have substance. I'm material. I exist in this way, but I'm also an event because I am more than just my structure and my body. I am also the sum total of my experiences, um, my, um, you know, my my experience and my emotions and my connections that I've made in the world. Um, and so I'm an event. So, you know, I think a lot of times, or they make the argument that the mechanistic model, you know, focuses on life as substance and they want us to switch to, um, to event thinking and not just life like a person. I'm talking about life with the capital L. This means nebulas. This means earth. This means Mars. This means stones. This means plants. This means other animals. Um, and so it's a holistic view of uh, events because everything exists more than just its material substance. Um, so yeah, I thought that was a real cool, cool concept. And then finally, before I run out of time, there was a poem that opens in the introduction that I thought I would read because I thought it was so beautiful. And they used this poem. The poem is by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Um, and they use it in the introduction to sort of help explain why they wrote the book and what they were hoping to accomplish with writing this book. And the poem is this uh, by Edna St. Vincent Millay, like I mentioned. Um, Upon this gifted age, in its dark hour, rains from the sky a meteoric shower of facts. They lie unquestioned, uncombined. Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun, but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. I think that's so cool. Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun, but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. Because I think what that poem is trying to say is that, you know, we have a lot of facts, we have a lot of knowledge, um, and we have a lot of wisdom, but, you know, we need structures to apply that to. And so they were trying to, they were hoping to accomplish through this book to apply the structure of ecological model uh, that then, um, you know, new ideas could graft onto. So... With that, I will end the chat on the liberation of life. So glad I got this read. I was real curious how I would react to it again after all this time has passed since I read it, and I enjoyed it thoroughly and will read it again probably at some point in the future. I will not wait 30 plus five years or whatever again to read it. I'll read it again before that, that amount of time. Um, anyway, on to the next thing. Um, what I'm currently reading. So what I'm currently reading, let me just pull that up for you. Um, Real quick, I'll touch on it just real briefly. It does not have a pretty cover, but nevertheless, I will show you. I just got started on this. I'm about 10 or 15% in. This is Disarmed, the story of the Venus de Milo, you know, the famous statue. And so, uh, I'm, yeah, this is by Gregory Curtis, published in 2003. I'm just kind of getting into this, but it's, so far it's real. It's a narrative kind of driven nonfiction work, and it's uh, really engaging and interesting and easy to read. So right now, uh, I'm enjoying that. And so what is my next read going to be? Let's take a look and see. I'm letting the randomness of the universe choose my reading order for my priority reading list. So I have all the books listed here. Um, we have Compass. 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 All right. So Compass is by Matthias Aynard. Let me pull up the cover for you. Um, I read this in, I read his, uh, another work by him earlier in 2017 called Zone, and I really liked it. I really loved it, actually. This compass is, um, from my understanding, it is, um, it is about a musicologist, and this, this fit into my, uh, my musicology, my, I mean, my music and art uh, theme that I chose, uh, one of my themes that I chose to read for this year. Um, so, um, yeah, um. Let me just see if I can get the, there's the cover for you. Oh, it's not wanting to pull up the cover for some reason. Maybe I can get it here in a second. There we are. Yeah, Compass by Matthias St. Art. So yeah, I chose this. Um, it's a it's a musicologist, I think, who 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 falls into like a dream state, I think, and we, we, uh, we experience some of his dreams and memories and... Um, 
of 19th century composers and I think there's literary figures and lots of things going on in there. So um, I'm looking forward to reading that very much. So that will be coming up next. Um, until next time, take care. Bye.